Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we're joined today by Nigel Sizer, the Global Director of uh, World Resources Institute's uh, Forest Program and the WRI team here in Indonesia. Um, so Nigel here will uh, demonstrate the Global Forest Watch, uh, which is an online forest monitoring and alert system. Um, he's going to talk about how GFW can be used in Indonesia as well as uh, worldwide and what WRI's plans are to support Indonesian stakeholders uh, with early detection and monitoring of fires and haze during the upcoming uh, dry season. Um, before we begin, I'd like to just give a short introduction uh, to Nigel. So as I mentioned, he's the global director of WRI's forest program. Um, this includes Global Forest Watch, the Forest Legality Alliance, and the Global Restoration Initiative. Um, prior to WRI, Nigel served as the Vice President for Asia with RARE. He also served as the lead advisor on climate change and energy issues in Asia to former President Bill Clinton and the Clinton Global Initiative. And he's also worked with UNEP in Nairobi and he established the Nature Conservancy's Asia Pacific Forest Program. So thank you very much, Nigel, for coming here and for the, G uh, the WRI Indonesia team for joining us. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I actually used to have an office here, so it feels like coming home. When I was with the Nature Conservancy, um, I had an office for three years here at C4 when David Kaimowitz was Director General, and uh, we did some wonderful collaboration together, particularly with Christoph Obzinski and his team. Um, there's several of my colleagues here. I would like them to just stand up and say hello so that you know who they are. Maybe uh, each of you could just introduce yourselves and just name and what you do very briefly. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Paula Mest. I recently joined the WRI. I was with the World Bank in Jakarta for four years with the environmental team. Uh, and I'm the recently hired Indonesia manager for the Global Forest Watch. So helping create partnerships and leading engagement with Indonesian stakeholders and the GFW and the sister websites as well. Good morning, selamat pagi. My name is Hidayah Hamza. Uh, I work with the GIS, uh, with the WRI Indonesia, just for this recent two months. Thank you. Hello semua, selamat pagi. Uh, nama saya Tanya Puspita Firdausi. Saya uh, bersama dengan Mbak Hidayah sebagai GIS analis di WRI Indonesia. Thank you very much. So we actually have an evolving collaboration and partnership with C4. We were just having a meeting with your Director General, uh, very much hoping that that's going to deepen and expand significantly over the coming years, and I, th and I think there's a good chance that will happen. We've also just joined as an implementing partner for Landscapes Day. I think we're the only NGO um, at that's at that level in, uh, in, in the organization of Landscapes Day for, for Lima. So, so close links, long historical links. I think we received one of the, when C4 was first established, I was telling the team this morning when Jeff Sayer was setting things up here, we actually, I think, got probably the first grant that C4, at that time C4 was giving out some grants. I think we got the first grant for some work we were doing in Brazil at that time in 93, I think it was. Um, so, so the connections between C4 and WRI go way, way back. Um, for those of you who don't know, WRI is a global uh, think tank and do tank. Uh, we've got about 500 staff now on the team, and we're organized across six programs, forests, water, food, climate change, energy, and cities. Here in this region, our most active program is the forest program, um, but our cities program is also becoming, and, and our climate change program also becoming more and more engaged here as well. Here in Indonesia, uh, we have a team now of about 10 people working full time on forest issues. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the Global Forest Watch Initiative uh, and how that has been evolving. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard a little bit about it, seen some of the news coverage and so on. Um, it's a major initiative at WRI. It's our largest effort on forests right now. It actually builds on work going back over 20 years. We launched the first Global Forest Watch in 1999 as part of something called uh, the Forest Frontiers Initiative. And, um, and that was an effort that was very much uh, based on uh, reports like this, publishing as up-to-date information as we could about what was happening to forests in key 
At that time, we were focused on what we called the intact landscape. So Russia, the Boreal, uh, the Congo region, Indonesia, parts of the Amazon, the Guyana Shield, and so on. And so you can hear, see here a sampling of, of some of the reports. We actually did the first interactive atlas of Indonesia's forests at that time in collaboration with the Ministry of Forestry. Um, so this was, this was the norm and what we were doing merrily until four or five years ago. Um, but of course it's not good enough. This kind of information is typically several years out of date by the time it's actually published, read, and policymakers are starting to look at it. If they read it and look at it at all, which um, I think my sense is that they increasingly do not want to look at these kinds of reports and read them. Um, and at the same time, you know, our friends who are in the business community, the investment community, all take this kind of information completely for granted, updated every second or almost every millisecond online, thousands of companies, the world's economies, you can see what's happening almost instantly. It's free, uh, it's in many languages, uh, and it's very easy to use. We all probably look at this kind of information from time to time. This is the BBC website, and there are many you could choose from. So our sense, having worked on information about forests for many years, that, that is, is that it's time for a new approach, that we need to get as quickly as we possibly can to near real-time, if not real-time information about what's happening to forests around the world and deliver that in a format that policymakers can use and understand um, almost instantly. So it's a hugely ambitious initiative, but that's what's at the heart of Global Forest Watch. As you know here better than anybody, there is a huge amount of information about forests. There are all kinds of studies and data sets being produced constantly. Of course, there are still some very big gaps, but most of that information does not find its way to those who need to be using it. So the basic mission of Global Forest Watch, the initiative, is to take that wealth of information and the complexity therein and make it as simple and accessible for policymakers and policy relevant as possible, whether they're in government, NGOs, business, communities, wherever they may be. Uh, and of course, the good news here is that the technology now enables us to, to get much closer to realizing that vision. When we started this 15, 20 years ago, Landsat data was not available for free. You had to buy it from the USGS, and it was very, very expensive. Almost no one was doing anything with Landsat data at that time. Now it's all freely available, the entire archive, let alone all the other systems. Cloud computing enables us to take terabytes and terabytes of data and, and run parallel processing and sophisticated algorithms with those huge data sets and come up uh, with answers to some key questions, or at least get closer to those answers and people are used to sharing this kind of information with social media and, and online in various ways that we would never have imagined even three or four years ago, let alone 15 years ago. So a partnership of about 40 organizations has come together uh, over the last um, two and a half years to create Global Forest Watch. And what you have here is, I mean, you've got UN agencies, UNFFAO is also a collaborator now, um, some very key technology providers, Google, Esri, Planet Labs, who are high resolution satellite imagery, Scanex, uh, who are processors of high resolution imagery in Russia, uh, donors, uh, Norway, USAID, uh, the Dutch, the British, the GEF, and then various NGOs who have expertise on this around the world, together with some key um, practitioners in different regions around the world. There's a number of other groups, not on this slide, that are also involved, but these are sort of the, the key groups. Um, and they've come together to create Global Forest Watch, which we launched, as you may know, in February this year. This is the home page. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch to a video, which is a five minute video, which just takes an animated walk through some of what's on the Global Forest Watch system. Uh, and I'll talk while that plays. It basically stops me talking too much because I have to keep up with the video. And, uh, and then we'll come back to a few slides talking about what's going to happen next. So let's start the video here. And go full screen. So here you have the home page, which is where we just were. 
and you click on here or on the map here and it opens up. This is meant to be a very simple uh, and intuitive system. The resolution on the screen here isn't great, so you're, you're not going to be able to appreciate this. But you've got a, a set of pull-down menus. You can click on those tabs. There's information about what's in the data set for each of those tabs. So this is forest cover change. Uh, and what's selected here right now is the uh, UMD Google data set of global uh, tree cover change. There's near real time, former, uh, all the world's fires from the NASA active fires MODIS system. There's forest cover layers, forest use, logging, palm oil, plantations, and so on. All of the world's protected areas from the WPDA database. The people layer, we're adding data on traditional and indigenous land uh, into the system right now. And there's a news tab. We'll come back to that in a moment. So zooming in here right now into the Western Amazon, what's up on the screen here right now is the Google UMD high resolution uh, global data set that was published in Science last year. So they're core partners with us. And we've pulled up one of the protected areas here. This is the Surawee indigenous area. And the pink areas are tree cover loss year by year. And you click on the time slider and the tree cover loss comes up year by year from the Google Hansen data set. Uh, this, is, so this is 30 meter global resolution. Uh, a very, very powerful data set. Obviously, some significant limitations as well with that, which we can talk about. We can change the backgrounds by clicking on here. So this is bringing up a satellite, a composite satellite image background. In some places, it's very high resolution like this. This is actually some digital globe imagery that's within the Google database. So depending where you are in the world, switching to the satellite view, you actually can pick up a, an awful lot of context at surprising resolutions on what's going on. So zooming back out, you've got the zoom buttons over here. It's just like using a Google map. Coming over to Indonesia, and we'll pull up some of the other data sets in the system. So from the forest use tab, here are the uh, palm oil concessions uh, for Indonesia. This is Ministry of Forestry data. Obviously, limitations with that, but it's the best that's publicly available. Click on any of those, and the name of the company and some basic information about the concession come up. And now we've turned on the near real-time former alerts, which are MODIS based at 250 meter resolution, updated month by month. And you can move the time slider around here to look at whichever time period you're interested in. So again, this is tree cover change um, month by month at medium resolution. So zooming in here, and you can see there's a protected area, palm oil concession, um, interesting patterns of tree cover change here, of, of tree cover loss. Um, and this is now being very actively uh, used um, in the industry, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Switching to the other layer, you can actually see clearly here is the area that's been cleared for the palm oil license. So those are all automated algorithms that are generating automated updates running on the Google Earth Engine cloud uh, every month. So zooming out, the last place we'll go to is Ivory Coast, uh, and the protected area here, uh, and you with the protected areas database and the tree cover loss and gain information, you can start to see some extraordinary dynamics around protected areas. This is key chimpanzee habitat, which seems to have been virtually lost. You can see exactly when that happened, how that coincides with local political dynamics, of course, which have been dramatic in Ivory Coast. But then you have other protected areas which seem to have fared much better. By clicking up here, we can draw on the map, and on the fly, it will give us an analysis for a week, the polygon that we draw, how much was lost, how much was gained over that particular time period. So, so it's a, an analytic tool as well, and you can subscribe to alerts for that area by typing in your email, and it'll email you an update on what's happening to that area as new data becomes available. So that's some of the basic uh, tree cover change data and how that can be overlaid with other data sets. The flip side of the system is the bottom-up piece. So this is displaying stories that people have uploaded into the system. So there's a crowdsourcing component here which allows you to submit your own story. You go to the Stories tab, you can bring up the various stories that people have submitted, 
and you click here, which says submit your own story, and type in a title. You can browse around on the map here, zoom in, uh, drop a pin anywhere on that map, and then you can put in uh, where and what happened, the dates, and add multimedia and other information to that, and that will be seen instantly. Most, I think most important for you here is that all the data sets in here can also be downloaded directly from Global Forest Watch. So we are designing this, this is designed for the general, non-technical user, but then in the background there's also all the technical stuff. So you can actually download all of these data sets um, in various formats and feed them into your uh, research program here as well. So that's the end of the video. Let me just out of that and go back to the slides. Okay. So we launched this in February uh, in Washington, D.C., and we've been quite taken aback by the level of interest, roughly uh, about 10 times the level of interest that we were targeting. Uh, literally within a couple of days, about 200,000 people around the world had gone in and looked at the system. Um, we, I think we're getting up to nearly 1,000 media stories now. Um, on the social media side, within the first week, we reached 15 million people through the tweeting and retweeting and Facebooking and all of that stuff. Um, and globally, the pattern of users uh, is quite... Well, we were happy to see how dispersed the use of the system has been. Remember, it works across several languages, so it's there in Mandarin, Bahas Indonesia, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic. Um, so this is, whoops, whoa, whoa, whoa. So this is from Google Analytics here, um, which is amazing if you've never played with Google Analytics with a website, but it shows us that the US has had nearly 100,000 users but then across the world, we're seeing nearly everywhere else people have been looking at it, with the exception of Western Sahara and North Korea, uh, over 200 countries and territories. Um, this is this. I took this screenshot yesterday, but the map already was was sort of pretty colourful within the first few days. But as of yesterday, uh, you get it's interesting to see who's in the top 15 here and how many people have been have been looking at this compared with the kind of reach we would have with the normal kind of communications work we would do. So Russia is up there with 30,000 unique, uh, 30,000 sessions. Um, so about two thirds of these are, are, would be unique visitors. And then you've got France, China's coming very high up on the list. Brazil, nearly 20,000. Indonesia's number 15 at 7,000. Um, so this is, we were very happy to see this, happy to see people in countries where forests are a very big deal uh, paying attention to the system and, and starting to use it. We've now got about a, the current return rate of current users is about 40%. So people are coming back into the system and they're staying in the system now for five or six minutes on average, whereas around the launch, the return rate was about 5% with an average period of use of about two minutes. So we're starting to see use consolidate um, and deepen. So that's where we are right now, and I'm sure you've got some questions about that, but I quickly want to talk about where we're going next. This is a very active, ongoing program, and major investments are going to be made for several years to come to continue to expand the program. So the first area of development is country data. Right now in the system, you can select a country, and you can pull up some basic information about that country, quite a, quite a lot of which we draw from the FAO Forest Resources Assessment. Um, we want to tailor each country's piece of this much, much more to the priorities and interests in those countries. So that most people coming into this are interested in their country. We want to give them what they're looking for for that country. That's a huge, huge amount of work, but a very high priority. And then across the system is developing more specialized apps for more specialized user groups. And the one that's first out of the box that was launched in beta version uh, about a month ago is Global Forest Watch Commodities. We've been quite um, 
amazed at the level of corporate interest in this system, particularly from palm oil industry related companies, particularly uh, consumer goods companies and major trading companies, folks like Unilever, Nestle, Wilmar, Golden Agri Resources, and then the broader roundtable on sustainable palm oil process. We, our team here has been very active on palm oil issues for several years, and we're very active members of the RSPO. Uh, and so we've teamed up with RSPO and the other partners in Global Forest Watch to experiment with Global Forest Watch commodities, which aims to take the information in Global Forest Watch, then add commodity-specific data sets to allow companies to start to make progress in addressing the traceability and transparency challenges that they face. Uh, as some of you know, they've made commitments to what they call deforestation-free palm oil and pulp and paper and so on without defining any of those terms. And I would say broadly still without having defined those terms a year or so later. So we're aiming to help them address those challenges. Um, here again are the partners here. So this time you've got RSPO added into the mix. Here's a sc few screenshots from Global Forest Watch Commodities. So this is more specific to, to this region right now on palm oil. It will expand for soy and beef and so on with Latin America becoming very involved. But you've got um, land cover and land use data added into the system, overlain with tree cover loss. And you've got um, the RSPO uh, member concession data. So if you're an RSPO member company, you have committed to share your concession maps uh, publicly, uh, which is actually very precedent setting. As you may know, the quality of concession maps available from the government here right now is variable. Um, and so the companies actually have the most detailed and accurate maps, and they are now uh, forced to share them through a resolution that they actually signed on to at RSPO. And they're using Global Forest Watch Commodities as the place to disclose that information voluntarily. So this is what's in there right now. Each of these is an RSPO oil palm concession. Um, these are the certified ones, and by November, all of the members' concessions will begin here, a lot more than you can see here right now. So if you are sourcing from um, the SIPEF group, you can pull up the SIPEF group's group-level company data in Global Forest Watch Commodities and see what the various overlays are telling us about, about uh, tree cover loss, what land uses those are over, how many fires there are currently in their areas, and other useful information. You can also look at it at the PT level, at the company level, rather than the group level for a more detailed look. And you can overlay this in various ways, so for fire monitoring and, and so on. So we're in this partnership now with these companies who, who don't provide any financial support. What they're providing is their expertise to help us understand how can the information that we have or information that we don't have but could potentially be generated with further investment, how can that inform their supply chain management decisions as they shift to what they call deforestation-free commodities? Um, the second example is Global Forest Watch fires. Uh, this is going to be hopefully launched next week in Jakarta. We've been working very fast on this just literally over the last month. Because of the fires issues here, uh, as you know, we've probably some of you know we've did a lot of work on that over the last year. Um, some of it um, quite working quite closely with David Gabo here as well at C4 to basically publish very simple GIS analyses overlaying fire alerts with concessions in protected areas and so on. Very controversial um, and it generated a great deal of discussion amongst the companies and the governments and the enforcement agencies and so on. So we're, t we're now taking that and adding some additional information to it and creating a tailored fires version of Global Forest Watch. And I'll just show you a few screenshots from that. This is actually the current Global Forest Watch, the general system, which has uh, fire alerts from the last week, the last three days, the last two days, and the last day. So that's what's on the general system right now that's been out there since February. The more specialized system looks like this. So it's similar configuration here, but you can also select only high confidence fires by clicking here. We're adding the NOAA fires data, um, and the web, the maps 
is, is focused on this region. It comes up with the peat layer on it as well, which is not on the general map. Um, and then you can click on any of these and bring up other fire relevant information. So here are the, uh, the wood fiber plantations, for example. So quite similar to the general system, but with some ad added bells and whistles. If you click on here, then you get an automatic summary analysis and figures of the fires over the past seven days. So this is analysis that we were periodically publishing and producing manually. So we've now automated this, so it's updated every day on the system for everyone to see. There are about seven different figures uh, like this, which, which, ooh, I keep pushing the wrong button. Hold on. Which, um, which, so this is which districts have the highest number of alerts over the last seven days. I mean, here we're really hammering home the message that fire work in Indonesia needs to be concentrated in this area. Riau is half of the alerts and three or four districts and sub-districts are where nearly all of those alerts are. That seems to have gotten through into the policy maker process, policy making process, and various ways of presenting that information. Very, very simple and easy to understand for those who are working on this. We're also adding some very um, attractive graphics. This is this actually on the system. This actually is an animated map of winds and wind speed, and you can see particularly here the patterns of wind and so on moving over Sumatra. So you can see, for example, here that Singapore was getting wind coming up from the south. If we I looked at it yesterday and actually the wind was coming that way. Uh, so you can see in real time, this is updated every four hours. So these are useful tools for the situation room and real time response from policymakers who are trying to figure out what's going on on the ground. There's also a Twitter conversations tab, which brings up any Twitter conversations and you can see those automatically uh, that, that refer to any specific hashtags related to the fires in English or Bahasa Indonesia. Um, as, as uh, when the fires get serious, there's a massive amount of activity on Twitter about that, particularly here in Indonesia. So we're putting all that together, and this is going to be launched hopefully next Wednesday in Jakarta with BP Red and some involvement from some other ministries as well, hopefully including Ministry of Forestry. Um, and, and you're all invited. We'll send the details over as soon as they're finalized in the next day or two. The system also includes an effort to increase the response time of the government. So we take the fire alerts, we prioritize them based on the data about each alert that's in the system, and automatically can send SMSs out to the Kapala Desa, the Chamats, the Bupatis, the Mangala Agni, the various firefighting response crews, and so on the ground. So we've put that together. We're now in discussion with the government about how they want to roll out an automated SMS communication process, which we believe would cut the fire response time uh, by some agencies from about 35 to 40 hours, which is almost um, useless, of course, to something more like four or five hours for alerts coming into Jakarta and then communicated with orders to fight fires on the field. So that's um, quite a simple set of technologies that, we've, that we can put together to do that. So that's already up and running. We're waiting for the government to, to look at how they want to uh, in integrate that into their management systems. Um, and we will roll it out ourselves directly with some of the companies and so on, probably uh, with, the, uh, with the alerts coming directly from our system in the US. This is an example of a sample SMS alert that you might receive um, overnight with the lat long of a, of a fire and so on and we can obviously tailor those to say whatever would be most helpful. Um, working with Google Earth Engine to look at how we can add information about how to access that particular fire and what water sources there might be nearby and automate that as well. So that's where some of the big data map stuff can potentially come into play for very rapid response across very, well, basically across the whole world potentially, but certainly across an area, the scale of Rial um, at, at, at very low cost. The other piece, the final piece I'll talk about here, is beginning to work with um, ultra high resolution satellite data. This is extremely challenging because of the size of the files, because of the cost traditionally of this data, um, and, and, and we're just not used to handling this type of information, and most researchers are not because it's, 
usually the provenance of private companies and intelligence agencies. So we have a partnership, a new partnership with Digital Globe, who own four ultra high resolution satellites that pass over Indonesia twice a day. Um, and they are now sharing data with us, tasking those satellites as fires are detected and trying to collect images of the fires. Um, and those are all going to be shared on Global Forest Watch fires as well. The, I'll show you what they look like in a second. Um, the interesting thing about this partnership is that we've been able to bring down the cost to a level that we can afford, although it's not still not cheap. Um, and more importantly, the licensing arrangement we have allows us to share these at full resolution with you, with the government, with the universities, with anyone who's working on these issues. So we're going to make all of this freely available. So David Gavo and his team and others here will hopefully be able to take this imagery and do some, some important research with this. Um, so we have a, basically a perpetual license that allows us to share it with anyone who's working on these issues. And I think that's the first time that's happened. So here is what you see on the Digital Globe interface. They've captured this image. And you zoom in, and you, they, they've put it It's in false color here. But basically, you can start to see here at zoom level 13 an area that's burned and an active fire and smoke plumes. You can see which way the wind's blowing, and you can see precisely where the fires are burning. Um, but we can go much better than that. So we can zoom into 15, 16, zoom level 17 here, 18. And here you can start to see. It's not so good on this screen. Here you go. So, so this is the maximum zoom level, um, although this isn't full resolution because of the file size and the screen here, right? But you can, you can see here individual palm oil trees, precise burn scars. And we also have access to their archive, so we can start to try to see the history of land use in each of these areas. So this is a, hopefully a boon for speeding up some of the research on the dynamics around the fires, and could have interesting applications in the law enforcement process, because you've got a precise timestamp and a precise lat long for every point on these images. Um, so this is, all being, this is already being made available to the government on a day-to-day -day basis as we collect it. Oh, we can, sorry, one more zoom level there. Um, another image there, in, this is more real color. So you see here active fires, an area that's burned, again in a landscape of palm oil and scrub. Um, and if you know the context on the ground as well, or you could go out there and look, you can learn a lot from this. And then we can render them in this type of format. So here's the fire, here's the scar. We locate the scar for the policymakers precisely on the map, provide them with this information, and then it's over to law enforcement to go out and see whether that's helpful. Um, coming soon, um, we're working very actively right now with the Woods Hole Research Center and University of Maryland on a global uh, carbon flux and carbon stock layer for the maps at 30 meter resolution. Uh, we'll be launching the tropical piece of that at the Lima COP, so we may, well, may well include presentations on that at Landscapes Day. Um, and the global, uh, the, the full global coverage of that will be launched at the Paris COP next year. Global Forest Watch Biodiversity in partnership with Eric Dinnerstein, who used to be at WWF, the WWF chief scientist in DC, is one of the leading global experts on patterns of biodiversity and biodiversity data sets around the world. So he's now part of our team, um, and we're designing and developing Global Forest Watch Biodiversity to take the, the biodiversity data sets and present those in a way that support improved decision making around infrastructure investment link it in with the fire stuff, um, and so on as well. Go, no, go zones for the commodities industry, for example. Um, Terra I, uh, which some of you may know was developed by SEAT. I think I meant, did I mention that earlier? Did I talk about Terra I at the beginning? No. So Terra I, SEAT Columbia have developed a wonderful near real time alert system for vegetation change, not just forests that we're now integrating into Global Forest Watch, and we're funding them to take that to the pantropical scale and increase the frequency of updates through a major partnership with SEAT and the CG system. And I also showed you some, of, I just showed you some of the high resolution work 
saying, learning from our experience here with Digital Globe, as that develops, uh, we want to potentially apply that to many, many other problems around the world, such as detection of, of illegal logging across the Congo. Several governments there have have indicated their interest in us supporting their efforts to enhance enforcement around detection of illegal logging roads, snaking out of concessions and cutting blocks and so on into areas where they shouldn't be. The high resolution information allows us to do that kind of thing. Um, it's not just tropical, it's global. We've actually got a piece coming out uh, maybe today um, on our website on the tar sands and Canada and the XL pipeline, which is a huge, huge story in North America, the biggest environmental story ever, just about in North America, I think. Um, looking at uh, deforestation, forest conversion linked to tar sands development in Canada's very special boreal forest. Um, basically about two million acres of boreal forest has been cleared over the last few few years, I can't remember the time period, um, since 2000, I think, uh, for tar sands oil development, and some of its very precious caribou habitat and so on. So more and more work of, of that kind. Um, I'll stop there, take some questions. There are lots of challenges and constraints and shortcomings with this work as well that we are quite familiar with. I'm very interested to get your perspective on those. Um, and we look forward to a much more collaboration on this with C4 in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Uh, can I ask uh, uh, people to stand up and state their name and uh, nature of their research? Okay, um, thank you, Nigel, uh, with you again. It's a very, very excellent uh, presentation. And um, perhaps uh, this is a great effort, really, that uh, maybe a scientist can take a lot of benefits from the existing uh, uh, database or information like this. Perhaps uh, also important to have a real or clear uh, data dictionary. Data dictionary, because, um, for instance, how, the definition of forest is not necessary all people uh, talk the same thing when we talk about forests. Um, inside country also, um, uh, the different definition uh, dif for different country. For instance, Malaysia defined forest quite differently from how Indonesia defined forest. I'm wondering how actually uh, this kind of uh, global uh, database, if you want to say, it, can um, accommodate the different kind of uh, uh, definition of forest. So to me, it's like to have a clear and um, strong uh, data dictionary is very, very important in, in this uh, um, database. And the second one is uh, talking about the, the, the update. Uh, because it's, uh, this also covers the dynamic of uh, the data. It's very nice about the, the fire. But sometimes the, uh, the dynamic of data is also about the, uh, the government. I mean, uh, sometimes, uh, for instance, government already canceled this concession. It's no longer exist. Yeah. You talk about Siak Raya and your data, but actually, uh, government already, for instance, um, canceled this uh, concession. I don't know how often you actually update the, uh, the, this kind of uh, data. It's very, very challenging, this kind of dynamic. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Harry. Um, Pat Harry and I did a wonderful panel. Uh, when was that? It seems like a long time ago. I think it was last week in <laughs> Jakarta on the fires at the Jakarta Foreign Correspondence Club. Um, and that was a great discussion there. In terms of the data and the definitions, of course, this is a huge issue. I think Ken McDickin at FAO who used to be here a long time ago, likes to say he's cataloged something like 2,000 or 3,000 different definitions of forest and what forest means. Um, so this is a huge issue. A couple of things. We're very, very transparent about what definitions we're using and how the systems are derived. So you click on the info bubbles or go to the data page, and it takes you right back 
to the original citations and summaries of that research. So, so people can see if they want to what it is that we're working with here in great detail and then work with the data directly themselves. So we, we aim to be very, very transparent about what we are using. There is a modification to the system which is in the process of being coded right now. I don't know if, Paul, you know when that's coming into effect. That allows you to change the definition of forest in Global Forest Watch, and that will change the analyses and what you're seeing on the screen. So we're able to adjust whether we define forest as 10% tree cover, 25% tree cover, 50%, 70, 75%, something like that. So there's basically, like on an iPhone, you can change the settings with little sliders. We'll have a default setting, which corresponds to the FAO for our definition of 10%. But if you know a lot about this and you want to start fiddling with the settings on the system, you can go in and start to do that and see how that changes the results. So that's, it's very constrained by what's in the data and the resolution of the data and how, how far we can go with that. But as time goes by, we'll be able to do more and more of that. So, so that hopefully allows more people to work with the system with a definition that's closer or closest to what they're currently working with. In terms of updates, the concession data here in Indonesia is, of course, extremely challenging. And we're getting into that in quite astonishing detail with the government right now, um, with various agencies as they, as they recognize the value of putting this together with the data sets that they have, many of which are not yet public. Um, and, and yes, the situation is very, very challenging. Um, on the fires, we're starting to dig in deeper at certain parts, certain places on the map where there are repeated and very serious fires. So who is actually there on the ground, which company is it? Is it palm oil, is it pulpwood? We're seeing areas that were on our map as pulpwood are actually clearly palm oil. We can start to see that with the high resolution imagery as well. The maps in the Ministry of Forestry versus in the province are completely contradictory, even on the basic type of licenses that, is, that are issued for some of these very significant areas where there are fires and a lot of conflict on the ground. So what we, so we're figuring out how to, how to deal with that. For now, we, we'd like to continue to use the national government's published databases, but are aware that there are some serious inaccuracies with that, as they themselves have said. Um, we may try to move towards showing the various different databases as we get access to those, so that people can also see that this is very problematic, and that will then create more impetus for resolution of these discrepancies by the government. And as you know, there are people in the government working very hard to try to resolve those discrepancies right now. Um, so the more resources and the more support that they can get broadly, um, the more rapidly that work will advance. Hey, <clears throat> Nigel, thanks very much. Very enlightening uh, talk. I just wonder whether you can, uh, you've been here for a long time and been working on this issue for a number of years. Uh, what would be new in this kind of exercise, especially on the approach? People keep on talking about bottom-up, bottom-up, and then forget about top-down. Uh, which is still still important. Um, is there anything new that we can really push this approach? As we are talking, yeah, fire is raging somewhere else, and a lot of new institution is in place. And what would be the appropriate entry point to deliver this kind of information? Talking about Indonesia specifically. That, that's a tough question. Um, you, I'd be interested in your answer to that more than mine. Um, what's new here? So trying to get closer and closer to real time. Policy makers, particularly very high level policy makers, ministerial level, want, they need to know what's going on. They need to know what's going on now. 
They're making decisions on the fly, very big decisions, um, and, and they're very constrained by poor information about what's happening out there on the ground. So the message we get from them is the more, the more precision you can bring to this, obviously, the better. But the closer you can get to real time, the value of that, the message is almost that's also of exponentially increasing value the closer we get to real time. Data that's several years out of date by the time it's been published and peer reviewed um, obviously has a value for long term policy making, but not, not responding to the kinds of rates of change and dynamics that we see on the ground in Indonesia right now. So what's been the impact of the moratorium up to a month ago? That's, that's what policymakers in Jakarta want to understand. Um, where and why are there so many fires again uh, in early June? Uh, as the, why are they in the same places as they were in February and last June? Um, and who actually is responsible on the ground for that? What is the response of the various agencies that are trying to respond to those fires in practice on the ground? Policymakers in Jakarta do not have that information to hand right now. Um, so giving them up-to-date information that's closely tailored to what, to what they need and what they, what they understand is extremely important. In the business community, the confusion, the level of confusion right now is, is high. Uh, if any, any of you who are working on palm oil and the corporate standards around palm oil would know that you've got RSPO, ISPO, the Malaysians evolving standards uh, on the production side, RSPO plus, uh, and then on the consuming side, you've got the consumer goods forum, all the big consuming companies globally who buy this stuff, saying we want deforestation-free palm oil. Um, what does any of that mean, and where is that going, um, and and is that informed by any good information and data? Again, and they want that in near real time because they're making buying decisions. They're involved in business transactions day to day with 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 across literally a company like Unilever literally is sourcing from six or seven hundred palm oil mills across Indonesia and Malaysia day to day through Wilmar and Cargill and suppliers like that. And they want to shift those patterns of buying to areas where forests are being managed better rather than worse. So, so there's a very, very direct demand from extremely powerful and resourced um, stakeholders who can make changes very quickly, but they do not have the information they need to do that. So we are racing to pull together the existing data sets and new data sets and task satellite systems and so on to see if we can start to answer those questions in a way that would inform those buying decisions. And then further upstream, inform the investment and banking decisions and the equity investment decisions that are being made around the world. So very direct impacts on Indonesia, very direct market signals from Indonesia, if that can be done um, effectively. It's ex but it's obviously extremely challenging. But the, I think the only way we can do that is through these kinds of tools and systems. And then we have to combine that with information from the field. So the crowdsourcing side of this is the other piece of the technology which I just barely touched upon. Um, Indonesia has tremendously high cell phone and even smartphone penetration, even in rural areas. Uh, how can that be used to gather feedback from the field, including of things that we could never see from space, like labor violations, child labor, slave labor, bonded labor, and so on, uh, which these companies are equally committed to eliminating from their supply chains. Um, clearly, it's possible, in theory, to start to do that. So we're we're looking at those aspects as well. But that's, that's what we need to try to bring together here. And I think the, what we see in the evolution of the technology is that this will get easier and easier over the next two to three years. Um, and then the, 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 the tremendously interesting part of this is what do the institutions here then do in response to the opportunity to use this information to make better decisions? That's where, that's, where, that's your bit. <laughs> Hi, Nigel. Nice to see you. I'm Celine. Uh, I'm an intern here with uh, Christoph working on palm oil. Um, and I was curious about the 
response of neighboring country governments, such as in Malaysia and Singapore, and what has been their response and their desire to be part of this? Thank you. Celine is from Singapore, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, the Singaporean response is the most interesting and the most active. Malaysia's response is also very interesting, I think. They're very different from each other. Um, in the context of ASEAN, the five governments that work together on the Hays have biannual meetings, and um, we've been party to some of those discussions, um, um, sort of up close, because of the work we've been doing on this. Uh, the, the significant development there last year was Singapore pushing the five governments to commit to share more accurate concession data with each other. Malaysia and Indonesia, but Malaysia actually more than Indonesia, are, I think are, um, are very strongly opposed to doing that publicly, although Indonesia actually already has published a lot of information publicly to their credit. Malaysia has not at all, I don't think. So there's an interesting discussion going on about transparency. The, the, those, suff those in other countries, those in Singapore suffering from the haze want to know who's responsible on the ground. So they've been pushing that piece of this on the transparency, um, which obviously would be very helpful. We're pushing that very strongly as well, not primarily for the reason the Singaporeans are, but because we believe that simply having more accurate information of this kind in the public realm is key for coordination across agencies from the federal to the local level with Indonesian civil society, with research institutes like C4 who want to, to do more detailed work on this. Um, and there are many in the government here who are sympathetic to that. The other piece of the response, um, more, more clearly from Singapore, is the new transboundary haze pollution bill, which had its first, first or second reading in the Singaporean parliament last week, I think, very recently, um, which now imposes actually much higher penalties than the first version of the bill did, several million dollars potentially in fines for companies uh, who Singapore finds guilty uh, in court in Singapore of generating haze which harms Singapore. So they can take Singaporean-based companies to court. They can also take Indonesian companies or Malaysian companies to court. There's haze also coming down quite a bit from Peninsula Malaysia that affects Singapore as well, depending on the wind. Um, perhaps most striking in the legislation though is, is it also allows for civil cases to be brought. There are criminal cases, but then there are civil cases. So Celine, as a Singaporean citizen, could herself bring a case against a company that is polluting the air she is breathing in Singapore. Or, hypothetical example, a hotel owned by her sister or the national airline or any company like that could bring a civil case against companies that affect them. And we saw last June very dramatic effects, and the most dramatic effects on the Indonesian economy, right? $2 billion in impacts, more or less, is estimated, uh, possibly hundreds of millions of dollars in impacts on the Singaporean economy as well, due to uh, fewer tourists, conventions being canceled, and, and so on. The, the situation on the ground there was extremely serious, even more, even more so in Riau. But so, so Singapore is basically, in my opinion, um, in a very tough situation on this and is doing whatever they possibly can to try to bring pressure to bear on the situation. They're also very active behind the scenes through diplomatic channels, um, but the diplomatic relationship between Singapore and Indonesia is extremely complex, as, as, as you all know. Uh, so it's not clear that, that there's very much progress being made there. Singapore's offered funding and so on for work on the ground. Um, how much funding would potentially be available is very unclear on the one hand, um, and Indonesia I don't think is particularly enthusiastic about, about uh, more Singaporean funding to do work related to the fires on the ground. There has been an ongoing effort in Jambi with Singapore research funding. Uh, maybe C4 has been involved, I'm not sure, uh, on these issues. So that's kind of where it stands. I can say right now that Singapore is extremely, extraordinarily nervous about a repeat or an even worse haze crisis than the one that happened last June because of the, possi uh, you know, the high likelihood that, that we'll have an El Nino uh, extended dry season and worse fires this year than last year. And, they, they, it's, and then it's just a question of wind direction. Uh, it's really just a question of wind direction of how hard they're hit in Singapore. 
but, but as we always say, the real issue is here on the ground in Indonesia, where many more people are suffering and paying a much higher price for this than the Singaporeans. But it's bad enough there. So that's, I don't know if that answers the question, Selena. Is there anything else you were curious about there? Involved directly in GFW, or uh, we are we are in um, we have a very good discussion going on with the Singaporean government about this. They're very very interested in the work that we're doing. Um, I'll be so whenever I go through Singapore now, it always involves meetings with their Ministry of Environment, the National Environment Agency, and other agencies there uh, to update them on our work, which is all publicly available as well. They have some quite good technical capabilities there as well with their various research institutes. Um, so they've also been able to enlighten us on, on some of their research findings, which generally don't seem to have been made public. And some of the modeling and Hayes projection work that they've been doing. They have an interesting partnership with the IBM co-laboratory on Hayes modeling and Hayes projection. They've been doing some really impressive work at the um, Singapore Management University on anal analysis of Twitter and Twitter sentiment, um, including related to the fires, uh, as well as in Singapore, on the, on the ground in Singapore. They're monitoring about 300,000 Singaporean and Indonesian Twitter accounts to help monitor what's happening to fires, so it's to, to try to give them more real-time information. So we're very intrigued by, by how that can help inform a real-time response to the situation on the ground, because people are tweeting as it's happening. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that is, for example, we have no air quality data at all from Sumatra. There, none is collected. I don't think any is collected. If it is, none of it's made public. But we have very extensive air quality data from the peninsula of Malaysia and Singapore. So that's all going to be on Global Forest Watch fires. Could Twitter and monitoring Twitter actually be a, a proxy for air quality monitoring is something that is an interesting piece. It's not as good, but it will tell you that there is haze here right now as people are tweeting about it in various ways. It would be the only um, source of that information other than what we might gather with remote sensing. Um, hi, Nigel. I'm Grace Wong with the Livelihoods Program. Uh, my question relates to kind of the data that you have. Um, I mean, this is a tremendous effort and a great resource, but a lot of the data that you have are data that's amenable to be mapped. So you have the forests, the, you know, the concessions, the protected areas, and so on. But there's a whole slew of data that's really critical to forests that are not easy. So things like tenure, things like the RDAT thing, forests, and that's vague and uncertain. And as, as this resource becomes used for decision making, and you, know, you have a suitability mapper there on your commodities website, I wonder what you, how you see those risks, and you know what might be some ways to kind of manage these types of risks. Uh, that's a brilliant question. Um, there is a tab on Global Forest Watch called the People tab, uh, and we are in the process of adding data to that tab right now. So the first edition was made of a couple of months ago when we we added the first tenure local people's tenure data to that, which is community managed forests for Cameroon, which we had a, which we happen to have because we've been working on mapping in Cameroon for 15 years with the government and NGOs and others there. So if you go into Global Forest Watch and you click on the People tab and you pull up that and go to Cameroon, you'll see the first data set on Global Forest Watch for that. On July the 24th, we and um, uh, Rights and Resources International, Andy White's group, will be publishing a report on global mapping of, of uh, traditional tenure, uh, indigenous peoples, lands mapping, and so on. And to coincide with that report, we'll be adding, I actually made a note here, we'll be adding um, a bunch more uh, tenure and traditional peoples maps and, and data layers to this for us. Australia, Canada, uh, Australia, Canada, um, Brazil, Guyana, DRC, Liberia, and a couple of others. I can't read my handwriting. Um, so that's coming up on July 24th. 
we're in discussion with Aman about adding their data set here in Indonesia, which is a very interesting data set, and I think that will happen eventually. Uh, but as you say, this is extremely complex and sensitive. First of all, um, those groups may not want that information to be published because it's useful in negotiations. So how you actually visualize that the boundaries of those areas is a challenge. If it's there are uh, indigenous territories in Brazil with very clear and well-defined boundaries that are recognized by the government. So that's, that's easy to put up. It's already out there, and so we're, we're in the process of adding that. For countries like Colombia and so on, you've got Ejido maps for Mexico and stuff like that. But when you get to a place like Indonesia where there's tremendous conflict over where these lands begin and where they end and which particular rights are associated with which pieces of those landscapes, the visualization of that is, is, a, is a huge challenge. So we're basically looking for very creative ways to address those problems, such as showing the boundaries as rather indistinct regions on the map that don't disclose exactly where that area is, but make it very clear, for example, to a foreign investor or a company like Unilever that might have palm oil mills near there that are supplying it as deforestation is moving into that area, make it very clear to them that there are people here who broadly claim this area as theirs and are in conflict with these companies that are your suppliers. So in the commodity space, this gets very, very interesting. And the companies are very keen to see that type of information and be able to work with it because the risks associated with that for them as investors are huge in terms of brand and reputation. So, so this is a very high priority for us um, and we're moving through it as fast as we can, but there are additional complexities. And then, of course, there's stuff that simply there's not data available for. What's inspi very inspiring is the extraordinary, I think, expansion of um, participatory mapping efforts going on around the world. Uh, so, so those databases are, are growing rapidly. Um, and so we're committed to having that up here in a format that's useful, uh, respects the, uh, the opinions and demands of those communities completely um, and makes that as transparent as possible for everyone to see and doing that as fast as we possibly can. That's where we are right now on that. If you have any suggestions or input, um, we would be very happy to hear them. Sorry, just a quick, yeah. My name's Annie, I'm postdoc here at C4. Um, I just wanted to hear a bit more about the bottom up approach that you have. I mean, do you filter the stories that come through and can you distinguish between the different sources and do you accept scientific articles? I mean, is there a way to, to get to the sources and, and, and yeah. distinguish between that? Uh, so the crowdsourcing piece of this is, is, is very rudimentary right now. We, what we did, what we decided to do was simply create a crowdsourcing function in the system and then see what happened. We had no idea what would happen. Um, and the reality is that actually there's been very little use of that. Very few people, I mean, com compared with the hundreds of thousands of people who've gone in and looked at what's on the system, almost nobody has uploaded their own information. You can go in and upload anything you want. So if you've done a research paper at this protected area in Sulawesi, you could go in and drop a pin and attach that, and everyone going in and looking at Sulawesi would see that research paper. No one's doing that. Uh, if you are APP and you want to push back, or April, push back on accusations being made against your company, you could go in and put that information in the system. Uh, but they're not doing that. So we're very intrigued by why there hasn't been more uptake of this. Um, and we've got, a, we've got several colleagues who are working hard to understand that, learn from the best out there on crowdsourcing to see what the next generation of this should look like for Global Forest Watch. Um, in terms of um, the um, curation of what comes in from the crowdsourcing, right now if you upload something, it, it is, it's instantly accessible on the site. We'll remove any, you know, the standard languages, we'll remove anything that's inappropriate or abusive, um, but we haven't had to do that yet. So basically anything can go up, it's very clearly identified as not in 
endorsed by us or our partners. It's there as crowdsourced material, so take it or leave it if you're looking at that on the system. So that's kind of where we are right now. I think perhaps as we get into more specialized applications of Global Forest Watch with much more intense engagement with specific user groups, like for example around palm oil and slave labor, then you might get into a much, much more interesting and much more active dynamic with these kinds of tools, um, looking at where you've got potentially some real incentives for people to want to share that information. Hi. Uh, I've been using a lot the state of the forest for my work. And uh, usually the published figure in that report uh, is kind of uh, different from the official government uh, figures and especially uh, for example the impact of the fires in 98 and it's always a, a analysis in that report that you know claim that the government like covering up the actual uh, incidents of area that affected by fire or or any other you know uh, public figures and you mentioned earlier that you'll be closely working now with the government. So do you think that it would change? I mean, now your figure, published figure would be more likely similar to the government official figures? I don't know, I need, need your you know, opinion on this. And the second one, uh, would it be possible to analyze, to analyze the forest cover resulted from rehabilitations or any other you know, restorations activities because the government Indonesia, for example, has spent a lot, you know, of money in this. And uh, to analyze the effectiveness has been so difficult because we have a lack of this, you know, actual uh, forest cover that actually increased from that effort. So would be able to analyze from that. And my last question is, do you think uh, that Indonesia has been successfully reducing its emissions uh, because we have a commitment 26 or 41 percent? Uh, okay. uh, good, great questions. Um, and I'll start with the restoration one because we haven't talked about that yet. Um, so we have a sister initiative to Global Forest Watch at WRI called the Global Restoration Initiative. We're very active on that. It's a whole new area of work for us that we're investing great deal in, um, and many others are moving into that area as well. Uh, we've been in some discussions with the Indonesian government about that. We've been much more active in some other countries on that. And Global Forest Watch is the tool that we aim to use to measure success of restoration. The challenge is the resolution of the data sets and so on, the, the resolution of the data, the satellite data for doing that. So picking up early stage restoration, early stage growth, regrowth, uh, is difficult because it's not, it's very sparse. Um, it's hard to distinguish from pasture or a crop. Uh, and picking up fine scale like riparian restoration or agroforestry system is difficult as well. Dif sometimes difficult to distinguish from, from other land uses. So, so those are technical questions that we are very actively working on. And the higher resolution data and combinations of high and medium resolution data uh, could help us greatly to achieve advances in that area. What's on the system right now is from the, from the Matt Hansen Google data set, I showed the pink of tree cover loss. You can click on another button and you get a blue, which is tree cover gain. What you see very clearly across Sumatra there is expanding plantations. You see the blue of the plantations, big square blocks of blue coming up very dramatically across that landscape, very nicely. Um, so that would also detect restoration of larger areas as they mature, um, but won't, as I said, won't, won't pick up the early stages of restoration. So, so there is a, there's a technical remote sensing challenge there related to the confusion with other land uses and the resolution of the data that you required and then the cost of handling those higher resolution data sets. Um, I, I expect to see a we, there are advances in the technology over the next two to three, certainly five years, that should solve that problem, I would say, somewhat boldly. But based on what we know is going on in the industry, basically we expect to have near daily, very high resolution data available 
and you wouldn't need to look at that across the whole world every day, of course, but you know, once every year, once every couple of years, you could do a systematic analysis, or in certain, certainly at a landscape level, with that kind of data that would be very, very useful. We're already talking with some of the companies here who are, as you know, you know well, one company in particular that's committed to large-scale restoration efforts around their plantations, and, and how can they monitor and report on success with that in a credible way uh, is a question that they're asking us. In terms of the uh, fire data and discrepancies in what our analysis and, other, and your analysis and the government's analysis might say, um, clearly there are methodological differences there and there are political interests as well. Um, one, what, one thing we did last year that was very helpful, we thought, at least for us, in understanding and validating the medium resolution alerts the alerts that come up on Global Forest Watch are actually at one kilometer resolution from the MODIS system, derived from MODIS by NASA. Um, many people said they're not accurate. You're saying we've got all these, it's not true. Um, so we tested that with RapidEye data. We spent nearly $100,000 buying RapidEye five meter data post facto uh, and did a fire scars analysis. Um, and, uh, and C4 has, has that data. We gave it to C4 as well to David here. And that showed 97% accuracy of the MODIS data. So we were very happy to see that. And we published that also in those maps of the fire scars on, on, our, on our blog. And now we've moved up to the 50 centimeter resolution data, even finer scale. So for specific areas where you've got really serious issues, you can do, you'll be able to do an incredibly precise fire scar analysis, right, to the tree. I mean, this, this tree burned, that one didn't. This was the precise boundary. Um, and with the archive, depending what's there from Digital Globe, you'll be able to see a lot about the history of fire in that place as well, potentially. So, so that will help. Our, basically, our approach is everything that we're doing on this is made public, it's published. Um, if others want to challenge the results, they need to publish their material and their methods, and then we can have a scientific discussion about that. If they want to challenge it without doing that, it's not a very not a very useful discussion. And on the emissions, um, I'm, yeah, I don't think I've got much to say about that. I think there are others here <laughs> who know much more about that than I do. Uh, it will be the work we're now, we're now doing with the carbon flux and carbon stock at high resolution, of course, will, will help inform that. Um, and we look forward to working very, very closely with the MRV team here at BP Red, the team which has been set up under Igor Ade, to, uh, to see how what we're doing globally on that could, could be taken to even higher resolutions here and inform policy making and public opinion and media work on this here in Indonesia. Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, so I think we're going to have to um, end there, but uh, thank you for your interest. Thank you. And thank you, Nigel and WRI.